at Manthan, we've had uh, quite a few talks by academicians, and I always thought that the best ones are when academicians speak at Manthan. And I'm sure that today it will be an occasion like that. Uh, there are some inevitable questions which technology raises, and uh, I'm fascinated by the title of the talk which Professor Viren Murthy has said. And uh, I've always wondered whether the progress of technology is inevitable, one, and two, if it is inevitable, is it best under capitalism? But he says no, I think, and then we will hear him say that. Professor Viren Murthy is a professor of history in Wisconsin, uh, in, in US, and uh, he's quite an authority on China. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, he will refer to his work on what he's doing with China, what he's doing with technology. Right. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, Manthan and uh, Vikram for this um, very nice invitation. So first, a kind of introduction uh, to the problem, right? What, why be interested in romantic anti-capitalism? And then the second is going to be, well, what is the romantic? How do we understand romantic? So basically, the first two parts of the, of the presentation are going to be romantic and then capitalism. How do we understand capitalism? And here I'm going to be looking at certain new readings of Marx, right? Um, and that'll, that I'll go into in certain detail, um, looking at certain Marxists such as Moish Poston, um, something that's come up in Germany called the Neue Marx Lektur, um, and looking at their critique of romantic anti-capitalism. Um, and then also what their path towards something that's beyond capitalism, what does that look like? That's also something I'm going to be talking about in the, in the second section. And then I'll be looking at romantic tendencies in, cap, in, in Marxism, so that Marxism itself is sort of ten, has a tension between these two sides. On the one hand, a kind of technological kind of development, uh, some would say even a kind of economic a vision of economic progress, but then also a kind of romantic uh, resistance to that. And then finally, I'll look at um, examples of romantic anti-capitalism in Asia, and uh, there I'll touch a little bit on uh, Tamil Marxism. Okay, so now the next slide, introduction. So my talk today will defend what some people call romantic anti-capitalism, and I'll explain this in a moment. The point of today's presentation is actually very simple. Um, that the idea is that one might draw on elements of the past or traditions to confront the problems of capitalist modernity. But as one investigates this extremely simple claim, we will see that it entails more involved points about time, about history, and the nature of capitalism. Okay, so now um, Vikram mentioned in the introduction that there were, uh, you know, there are certain things that I've been working on uh, about in East Asia, and so I'm going to do a little self-promotion. Um, now the thing is, the self-promotion doesn't work as well because I don't have the picture of the book I'm talking about. But there are two books I'm going to mention, and one is called "The Politics of Time in China and Japan." And the subtitle is called Back, Back to the Future, right? Back to the Future. So Back to the Future, of course, is the name of that film. But I use Back to the Future to talk a little bit about like romantic anti-capitalism, sort of in some sense, you're going back to the tradition, but we shouldn't think of them as going back, right? What they're really looking for is a new future, right? So that I think is what, is, is what that book was about, mainly looking at um, Chinese and Japanese intellectuals. So the subtitle of the book is part of the topic of our discussion today. Um, and uh, to the extent that I believe that we should go beyond the opposition between conservative and radical and realize that those who argue that we need a return to tradition uh, usually have a vision of the future. So consequently, I, call the, I look at numerous figures um, who propose what I call back to the future narratives. Right, so those are the narratives that go back but go to the future, right? 
Um, so consequently, when as, as, uh, assessing conservative thought, or thought that we think is conservative, the real question I think we need to ask is what exactly is being conserved, right, and to what purpose? Okay, so that's self-promotion number one. Now self-promotion number two is a book that's coming out in October called Pan-Asianism um, and the Legacies of the Chinese Revolution. Now, this book, um, I, yeah, I ask and I contend that Pan-Asianists, whether they're in China or Japan and, and sort of India is hovering in the background there, um, they, I, I say that they all develop back to the future narratives. But now it's back to the future narratives that have um, a very specific relation to geographical space. They're back to the future narratives that try to create an, a vision of Asia, right? And I claim that this vision of Asia, at least until, you know, from the post-World War II period all the way to the 1980s, are actually confronting capitalist modernity in some manner and use the past to envision a kind of future, right? And so here I look at numerous figures who do that. The most famous is perhaps um, the Japanese intellectual named um, Takeuchi Yoshimi. But in both these books, I use the concept of romantic anti-capitalism. However, I don't an analyze that concept in any great detail. And so this is why uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Because I want to take this opportunity to discuss the implications of romantic anti-capitalism more fully. So now the first thing, romantic. What is the romantic in anti-capitalism? So to begin my discussion of romantic anti-capitalism, let's look at the first term, romantic. Now, what do we usually mean when we say romantic? And this is something that um, I, um, when I'm talking to my students, um, there's some images that come to mind. Now, you don't see the images, but um, let me describe the images. So the first, the images are really about love and romance, right? Those are what my students usually think. Um, and, and I think it's true in, in many places when I talk about romantic, they immediately think that I'm going to be talking about, you know, the, the latest film um, in which there is, there is romance. Um, and um, there is something to that, I want to say, but that's not exactly going to be my topic today. Because there are other places where we hear the term romantic, and such as the romantic movement, which of course includes romantic poetry. So let's consider this for a moment, right? That the romantic movement. So romantic poetry often refers to, to love poetry, but the movement is broader and could be considered as a larger response to the enlightenment and as an attack on the unique focus on reason. So that's often romantic in, in that other sense. Um, and it's often stated as a resistance to that which we can put in terms of rational argument or reason or writing down or words and so on. And we see this um, in, you know, we see that the resistance is to certain enlightenment thinkers. And we, here there are certain names that immediately come to mind. If you're an intellectual historian like me, then, well, clearly Rene Descartes, Spinoza, uh, Immanuel Kant, and then Hegel, and I have a question mark in front of Hegel because we'll come back to him. Um, but these are often thought of as philosophers of the Enlightenment who stress reason and stress, you know, things like that. But what they have, yeah, and that's what they have in common, right? They say that we can grasp the nature of reality through reason. So what's the resistance to that? So now take uh, a poem that maybe many of you know from Wordsworth, right? The Tables Turned. Right, so he says, he says, one impulse from the vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil, and of good than all the sages can. Sweet is the lore which nature brings, our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous form of things. We murder to dissect. Right? This, in some sense, captures a lot of what romantic is, because it is the, the intellect that sort of cuts things up, right? And the sages are the philosophers, right? But the impulse goes beyond it, right? The ethical is in the impulse, right? And that's where there's a kind of oneness. There are all kinds of things we can t talk about in this poem. Okay, so the romantics then are thought of as going against the Enlightenment, 
uh, the Enlightenment rationalists in particular. Um, and I put a question mark in front of Hegel because he expresses both sides of the opposition, I think. Uh, his romantic tendency is expressed in his distinction between reason and the understanding. And here, this, uh, there would be a Hegel quote which would be much easier, uh, but I'm going to try and read it slowly um, and try to visualize it. So, the understanding determines and holds the determination fixed. Reason is negative and dialectical since it dissolves the determinations of the understanding into nothing. It is positive since it generates the universal and comprehends the particular therein. So the key here is very simple. It's especially once you have Wordsworth's poem in mind, right? Remember, we murder to dissect. But for Hegel, the dissection is taking place with the understanding. Reason for him actually entails some of the romantic element, right? It's because it's trying to be much more whole, it's dialectical, it goes beyond sort of binaries or it sees the bi connection between binaries. Okay, so all of this suggests that the truth of romanticism might actually me be a harmonizing of both sides, right? And I think that's going to be the key. That is not both the rational and, and the so-called non-rational, right? I think that's the key. Okay, to bring this section to a close, right? So this is the first section, which is what is romantic. I'd like to complete the circle because I started with what romantic, romanticism is and I said it could be, a, you know, about these kinds of the emotional relationship, love relationships and so on. Um, so there is romantic love and on the other hand, the critique of reason are the two sides that I talked about. And so now I'm going to go back to Hegel again but this time to the philosophy of right, uh, published in 19, uh, sorry, 1821. So actually the good thing about not having a PowerPoint is you don't see my mistakes. Um, so, um, but, so where Hegel speaks about the family and the root here, which is, which is love. Um, and so now I'm, go I'm gonna just read parts of this because it's a somewhat lo long quote. And this is Hegel on love. So he says, love means in general, the consciousness of my unity with another so that I am not isolated in my own, für mich, but my self-consciousness exists only through the renunciation of my independent existence uh, with another and of the other with me. So, the first moment in love is that I do not wish to be an independent person in my own right, and that, if I were, I would feel deficient and incomplete. The second moment is that I find myself in another person, that I gain recognition in this person, who in turn gains recognition in me. Love is therefore the most immense contradiction. The understanding cannot resolve it. So here we see in this description of love, the overcoming of things like the oppositions of the understanding, right? So in that sense, we've, come, we've sort of in some sense brought the two forms of romanticism together. Okay, and so this, if we were to go further into this, this would be, this is in Hegel's discussion of the family, right, which he then uh, goes on to integrate into his larger philosophy of right. Okay, but at this point, you all are perhaps asking, what does any of this have to do with capitalism? And that's what we're going to get to next, right? We already get a hint of this response in the previous passage when we think about how Hegel defines love in opposition to the individual um, who does not see himself, um, who, sees, who does not see himself um, in the other, and that is the self-interested individual, right? So that, that you're going beyond the self-interested individual, which you could say is at the, at the heart of capitalism, right? So the literary critic, Michael Levy, made the following remark that is relevant to our discussion today. And he said, romanticism represents a critique of modernity that is modern capitalist civilization. In the name of values and ideals drawn from the past, the pre-capitalist, pre-modern past. So that in a nutshell is going to be the concept of romanticism that I'm going to be using for the rest of the talk. So the tension between sort of romanticism and capitalism goes deeper. Uh, and to understand this, we have to turn to Marx. My turn to Marx will not be to understand his work as a theory of class society, which is of course important, 
but to outline resources in this analysis which could help us to understand aspects of modernity. Right? So now, moving on to the next section. But before I go to that section, let's summarize what we've done so far. So first, romanticism um, refers to a striving for wholeness and well-being that has been fragmented by capitalist modernity. Consequently, we can understand its significance only by studying capitalism. Now, capitalism and Marxism. To grasp the importance of Marx's work for a theory of modernity, let us begin with the first sentence of Capital or Das Kapital. Many of you probably know this sentence, but I'm going to read it. The wealth of society in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Our, our investigation, therefore, begins with the analysis of the commodity. So that's what we're going to start with. He starts with the commodity. Note that he doesn't start with class. He starts with the commodity. So now, we see that one of the key points in Marxist theory, right, is the commodity. It is important to note that previous societies, in previous societies, the wealth of societies did not appear as commodities, but in other forms, right? That's the whole point. So that's why to get at the specificity of capitalism, we have to understand, well, what is the commodity? So what is a commodity? So the commodity, he says, is first of all an external object, a thing which through its quality satisfies human beings as hu so, and human needs of whatever kind. The nature of these needs, whether they arise, for example, from the stomach or the imagination, makes no difference. So we're talking here about very concrete commodities that can work as use values, right? So from the above passage, we know that the commodity is something that satisfies a need. There is no commodity that does not do this. But there are those things that satisfy needs that are not commodities, right? Marx gives the example of the air we breathe and things like that, and things like that that, of course, are con constantly yet now on, on the threat of being commodified, right? Water and things like that, right? But um, we will return to this when we talk about use values, uh, you know, that are not values. We could return to this. Um, there, there might even be a struggle to keep these things from being commodified, right? So that suddenly something's not air and so on. We don't want it to be commodified, but you might have to pay and so on, right? That kind of thing. Now, but he also says that commodities are bearers of exchange value, and that's going to be the most important part of his analysis, right? Because they're bearers of exchange value. Now, notice the difference between use value and exchange value, because that's going to be the key to the whole argument. Um, so, use value is intimately connected with the actual material for the thing, but exchange value is something that the thing bears or carries, right? It is separate from the thing, or at least separable. So there's use value in every society. That's what he often um, refers to as wealth, right? Uh, Reichtum. But we experience use value in a, per in a particular form in capitalist society, namely the commodity form. So we come to the problem of what makes exchange value in capitalism possible. We see people exchanging things every day. So what makes it possible? There must be some common element, Marx argues, that allows them to compare them. In other words, he's going towards saying that exchange value is not merely a quantitative rel relation, but a form of appearance of some particular common thing right, that allows them to be exchanged. Now, what is that thing? What makes things possible to be exchanged? Now, notice the common element can't be completely material, because if it's too attached to the thing, that's not going to work, right? Since this will be linked to use value and not pervasive, right? We are exchanging precisely in order to gain another use value, right? And that's what money often does, right? It, it, it ends up being that in a more abstract sense, the exchange value. So it can't be connected to the sensuous quality of the particular thing, because that's too specific. So he says that when we talk about exchange value, all the sensuous com qualities of the thing are ex extinguished. It is no longer, he says, a table, a chair, or a house. On the one hand, it is not 
It is, and then, of course, this is on the other side, labor un undergoes the same trans um, transformation. It is not the particular lab joint labor of the weaver, the tailor, or the joiner. On the, on the other hand, the root of abstract exchange value is abstract labor, which will in turn measure value. So there is a double abstraction going on. On the one hand, there is an abstraction from the useful thing or useful labor, right, the various labors, right, the joiner, the weaver, and so on. Um, and on the other, um, there's the abstraction from the commodity, the particular use, right? Um, so now we see another factor coming into, t into play here, which is the problem of time, right? Because we, we say, well, what is the measure of value, right? How do you, the measure of value is going to be the time congealed in the pro product. So let's look at this when we um, examine Marx's own uh, passage. And what he says, um, and here you would see the question, what remains after use value is abstracted, right? What remains after use value is abstracted? And here he says, let us now look at the residue of the products of labor, right? So these are all the products of labor, but what's the residue once you take away all the concrete things, right? What's the residue? And he says, the residue is that they're products of labor. Right? There's nothing left of them but the same phantom objectivity. Notice the term phantom objectivity. Gespenstige Gegenständlichkeit. They are merely congealed qualities, quantities of human labor. And the literal German is actually a mere jelly of indistinguishable human labor. A bloße Gelehrte. Um, and now, that is going to be the, the measure, right? So the measure is abstract labor time, socially necessary labor time, right? And here, um, this, it, there's, a, there's a nice picture where you could have, think, picture different commodities, right? You have different commodities, and they're all being reduced to these, the same thing, right? The same thing, which is the expenditure of human labor in the abstract, right? Um, now think about the labor process. Uh, you know, picture a picture brain, muscles, and then producing these two completely different things, right? And what's happening is just because it's brain, muscles, and so on, doing this for a certain time, these two are now going to be, these two things that are produced are, are able to be exchangeable, right? Another picture um, you can think about then the price tags on these different things, right? You've got the price tag of a coat, the price tag of a table, right, which are very two completely different things but from the perspective of, of exchange value the only thing that makes them difference is the quantity right so you can almost begin to say well how many coats does it take to, to equal a chair right um, or something like that right which two things which you can't really say at the qualitative right because if you really need a coat you know like if it's if it's if it's raining or something no matter how many chairs you give me it's not going to work right but in this sense, it does, it does, you, it doesn't make them, you, you can say, sure, I'll, ex I'll exchange, right? Okay, so I don't want to go too much into detail in, into Marx's analysis, but I'm going to look at the implications of this for a theory of modernity, right? So now we're going to move away from Marx a little bit. Not really away from Marx, but a different application of Marx, let's put it that way. So I'm, I'm going to say one of the tragedies, I think, of Marxist theory is that it is, it is often seen as an economic theory. And so the Marxist anti-Marxist debates often hinge on how important the economic is. I think that that's a mistake. However, since Lukács' um, history in class consciousness, there has been an attempt to see the commodity form, right, this form of abstraction, as not merely about economics, but a form that affects all other parts of society. And I think that's what makes it Im important for me today. So in this manner, one connects the commodity form to larger tendencies of society. So what, from, the pers from this perspective, capitalism is not just about exploitation, but larger tendencies. So what are these larger tendencies? And here I'm gonna do some more describing. So the first one is homogenization. So picture, if you will, very different people entering a door. And they're coming out all the same, right? They're coming out all the same, right? 
that's the homogenization kind of idea, right? And that's sort of what the commodity form does in this, in this, in, in capitalist society, according to Lukács, according to many, many, many people, right? Okay, so the other thing would be a kind of thinking that we might call calculative thinking, right? Because you're thinking more about the uh, quantitative dimension, right? And we could keep going. A lot of things that Weber, Max Weber, talked about in terms of modernity, rationalization, all of these things, um, I want to suggest that they are re related to the process of the commodity form. Okay, so now, um, once we have that down, and that is with Lukács and people like that, um, we have the problem of Marxist relation to romantic anti-capitalism. And it's usually not a positive one. So even among the Marxists who, over, who emphasize this overarching view, right, um, of capitalism as grounding modernity and to see modernity as a problem, romantic cap anti-capitalism as a solution is usually considered to be worse than the problem, right? And so let me explain this. We see this in Lukács already, right? Lukács was not a big friend of anti um, romantic anti-capitalism, except one could say very early he was into Jewish messianism, but he, but he sort of broke away from that. And he said the problem is that the romantics they, they overlook the problem of, ca of class, right? They're, they're anti-capitalist, but they don't really get the, the problem of capitalism, right? But more importantly, um, more and more, perhaps more recently, but even already with Lukács, uh, romanticism and romantic anti-capitalism is usually con connected to fascism. So we see this in the more recent critique of romantic anti-capitalism by Moish Poston. Um, and so put simply, and so now I'm gonna explain Poston's critique. So in Postone's view, the, the Nazis were romantic anti-capitalists and that they identified the Jews with the abstract side um, of capitalism or money, right? That's, that is his argument. And he says that's going to be a tendency of romantic anti-capitalism. He would add that something similar occurred with the Japanese during the interwar period as well, right? So now, you know, you, some of you have probably seen the, some of the propaganda, I would have the picture that, I mean, the whole idea, the way in which the Jew is seen, you know, as sleeping over on, on tons of money or, or, or you, you, you know, you over, is sitting on a huge globe, you know, with the word geld or money on, on, uh, under it, right? So, so this is this idea that the Jew then comes to um, symbolize um, the, 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 ex, the abstract side of capitalism and the idea is that, well, if you can get rid of that, well, then, you know, we can then move beyond it, right? And we can move to, to, to a more stable form of community, right? But in that case, then how do we understand uh, how we go beyond capitalism from the perspective of Postone or the, the uh, Neue Marx Lektüre, uh, of which Postone was a part, right? There's another genealogy that I'm not gonna go into there, there right? But, but so let's look at their solution. So their solution has a lot to do with technology, right? that the, the problem, you don't want to go back or, or go back to traditions or something, but it's technology itself that's going, to, that's going to eventually provide the possibility of going beyond capitalism, right? Um, and so there, here, we, we, you know, I'm going to skip certain parts of the analysis, but it has to do very much with relative surplus value and the idea that capitalism is always going to move to increasing technological mediation, right? And um, so there's a sense in which it keeps uh, replacing living labor, right? So machines keep replacing li living labor. So picture, you know, a bunch of human workers uh, and slowly they're being c converted to machines and finally the machine kicking the, the worker out, right? That's, that's the, the image that you want to see here. And then we can see this in, uh, in, in very concrete uh, pictures as well, right? Because we look at, say, factory, the factory floor, say in the 1960s, and then you look at the factory floor now, you have cases where you have much more automation, especially in like the auto industry, right? And so then the question becomes, well, why does this point to moving beyond capitalism? Well, it points beyond it, and here there's a, there's a line, a lot of these, these Marxists are looking at a particular fragment that Marx wrote in the Grundrisse, right? Those of you may, may know that that's, those are the notes that he used to, to make capital, right? He didn't publish them, but they're extremely important for the Neue Marx Lectura, the new Marx readings of Marx, but also 
also uh, for people like Antonio Negri, a number of Marxists, right? And, and this is, it is it's largely because of the fragment on machines. And I'm just gonna read one line from that that I think sums up the argument. So, and this is Marx in the Grundrisse. He says, capital itself is the moving contradiction in that it pose, presses to reduce labor time to a minimum while it posits labor time on the other side as the sore, sole measure and source of wealth. So what that means is not that. So it would be a misreading of this, this argument to say that, capital, that technology leads to socialism. That's not what they're saying at all. So I don't want to misrepresent them. What they're saying is on the one hand, capitalism is going to replace labor, right? But on the other hand, as long as society remains capitalist, labor time is still going to be the measure of value, right? Socially necessary labor time. So what that means is more unemployment, the precariat, all, many things that we actually see happening now. We have now picture this. You have a picture of a number of people graduating, right? trying to go into the work workforce and what they do is after they graduate they get to their they get their diplomas and then there's a door saying un unemployment right that that is the point of the of the new marxist right so that, that that they're saying that okay but but where is the silver lining in all of this in capitalism that doesn't work right it's going to just create more problems unemployment all these problems and so on but the point, and Marx's point already in the Grundrisse, is that if you change the system, if you make it such that the system is not just about producing surplus value and is not based on socially necessary labor time, then we have the possibility of bringing all these great forces of technology under collective control, right? So now picture these two alternatives. One is where the machine is oppressing the human being, right? A robot oppressing the human being. And the other, where these two people are just sitting on top of the robot and everything is fine, right? Because they're controlling, they're controlling the robot. What happens in capital is that it's capitalism, is capital controls the robot, which then controls the human being. But if you get rid of capitalism, you can now control, that's, that's the argument, right? And, and capital itself is making itself un, unsustainable because it has this contradiction. On the one hand, it, it needs labor time, everything is based on labor time, and on the other hand, it's getting rid of labor time, right? So that, that's the point. Okay, so this is the end of section three. So let me summarize. So following the new Marx reading, we can connect many of the core aspects of capitalist modernity, um, the modernity to capitalism, right? Homogenization, rationalization, okay. Second, Marx's analysis of capitalism is not just economic. Three, romantic anti-capitalism could lead to fascism, right? That's the, the other point. This reading of Marx is often seen as a vision, has a vision of the transition to socialism that stresses technology, but technology is not the, the, the end there, right? It's still, we need a movement to take, take over. Okay, so now, part four, back to romantic anti-capitalism. So, Postone and other Marxists point, their points are valid. However, my point again is very simple. Although Nazis were a form of romantic anti-capitalism, not all romantic anti-capitalism can be reduced to Nazism. Right? That's the point I want to make. Now, of course, here we would have to ask the question, well, why, do, why does this happen? And we could say that romantic anti-capitalism is potentially dangerous when it forgets or becomes disconnected from the concrete issues of class and labor, right? Now, there are romantic tendencies, romantic anti-capitalist tendencies in Marxism itself and Marx itself. And here I'm looking at, um, you know, the, the letters to Vera Rosasilich that many of you might know in his older period, he was writing where Rosasilich, a populist in Russia said, well, does Russia now have to actually go through 
um, all the stages and so on and become capitalist, we have to first become capitalist. I mean, this is something that's, that a lot of countries are facing, like China, there's a big debate about this. For, well, first we've got to do, you know, capitalism and then we can, yeah. And, and Marx, interestingly, he never actually sends this, the, the, the letter. The, the one he sends is actually very small. But the, one of, in one of the drafts uh, that a lot of people draw on, he says, no, 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 you don't have to do this. You can actually draw on things of the past where there are other forms of community. And those could be the the, the kind give you the direction for, for socialism. So, but, but I want to also say one other thing about the technological perspective. So the other thing is, even if the technological answer, right, that all we need to do is gather, you know, bring the technology under our control, if that is correct, I mean, even if, even if it is true, would that be desirable? So back to the image of the two people controlling the machine, sitting on the machine and going around, right? The question is, is that even the desirable type of life that we want, right? And I think there's a certain kind of issue already that's here, because what there is in this vision is a very, a, a potentially stark distinction between life and freedom, right? So labor and life are considered to be unfree, right? And the freedom is actually freedom from labor. Right. And so, so that I think is, is, but that's a question about, because I think the Marxist's original point was that no, no, there, there's something we should change what work actually is. Now, you could read the new Marx reading as, as somehow incorporating that, but it doesn't seem to be the main point, right? And I think this is where, what we could, where, where romantic anti-capitalism really comes in. So the romantic elements in Marxism con continued, right? So now there's been strands of, 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 um, of Marxism where people such as Harry Haratunian, Massimiliano Tomba, have focused on what Marx calls formal subsumption, namely that capital does not subsume all practices, um, and that these resilient practices could form the beginnings of a new post-capitalist future, right? So that's, that's the, ar the argument that they're making. Um, so I want to quickly say that I see some of this happening um, in uh, strands of uh, Tamil Marxism. So, and, and here I call Tamil Marxism Marxists who stress Tamil identity. So that some, they may not themselves um, refer to them that way. But so I'm taking one particular person, Kovai Nyani. And uh, one of the things he says is he says, he writes that in early history, there was no private property. People were one with nature. People worked for what they needed. There was no space in their lives for social competition, jealousy, and conceit. Now this is from his book on uh, the Tirukural, and we could say that that is a romantic conception of the past, right? It's a the romantic conception of Tamil and the Dra Dravidian past, and I'm not going to argue whether that was true or not. To me, that's not the, the point. The point here for me is what it's being used for, and I want to say that it's being used to specifically to resist capitalism. It's being posed as, the, as, 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 as a past that actually could be in the future, right? So there may have been many problems associated with pre-capitalist societies, but he wants to uncover, right? He attempts to recover a period where the subject and object, and by extension, being and knowing, all these distinctions were not there, right? That's the point. Now, this then makes the classical texts, um, such as the Tirukural, which is the book that he's um, d discussing in this text, significant as nodes of resistance. And so the whole read, the book is actually a reading of the, the, the Tirukural as, as being um, potentially socialist, right? So the idea of being and knowing not being separate brings us back, of course, to Hegel's idea of love and so on. Um, note that there's no space where the subject and object and so on are separate here. Moreover, uh, he was saying that the understanding cannot resolve that contradiction of love because the understanding always separates. However, as Marxists would always point out, the pre-modern societies are not just harmonious, but they're about hierarchical um, um, oppression, including caste and gender, all of these kind of things are there in the pre-modern pre pre societies. So what ends, what, what ends up happening by, in such Marxists is the romantic anti-capitalism has two sides. On the one hand, 
it is to show that subjectivity already exists, right? That there's forms of subjectivity there that, that could resist the hierarchy, right? Um, in, the, in, the, in the ancient Tamil texts. And then to show that these texts also overcome that individual subjectivity, right? Um, so let me, so, so the classical texts then express both modernity and its romantic overcoming. That's the, that's the, arg that's the rule, that the, the, the move that they usually try to make. So the Tirukkural, in that sense, is a great resource for such an interpretation because in addition to being revered, right, and well, it's a well-known text, it consists of a numerous couplets that are disjointed and therefore open to different reconstructions, right? How do you put it together is a, is a big question. So I'm just going to mention three texts um, that, to, that, that he uses to, to sort of give you a sense of what he wants to do. And, and because these texts are used by a lot of um, Marx, Tamil Marxist. So the one is some that uh, many of you um, know. Some people tell me, oh yeah, I learned, I, I talk about this, I, I, I learned this in the fifth grade. So it's almost like after many years, I'm going back to the fifth grade. But, but this one is, so the one is, even though the gods may be against something, effort, right, will reap appropriate rewards, right? Devatan agada eninum muirchitan mevat kulitarum. So that is this idea of subjectivity, right? Because even though God, and this is something Marxists really like, because it's not, it's not God isn't, even if God is against something, your own effort can, can overcome something. Now, this connects to subjectivity because it, it goes against something like fate. But the overcoming of subjectivity is there in, in other ideas, right? The feelings of I and mine are not but vanity and pride. He who crushes them enter a higher world of the gods, right? And some of you may know this, Kurul uh, 346, I think. Yan enudayanum serukkarupan vahan orku uyirinda ulagam pugum. So this is this idea that you go beyond, right? You go beyond the, the, the self. This is the negation again. The self negates itself and become, goes, goes to something else, right? So, so similarly, there's also something like equality, right? So all living beings, all living beings are one in circumstances of birth. Diversity of works give each their special worth, right? So here, this, there's a lot that, that Marxists can do. I'm changing the, tra the usual translation. Usually it's saying all human beings. But we are, I, I really think, should be, should be life um, because it, it goes beyond. And that actually opens up other, other possibilities. But here, notice that, that it's, it's some kind of work or toril that actually allows for difference as well. So it's a concept of equality that is not merely sameness, is what I, what I would like to say. Okay, so putting these various tendencies together, so we have subject eff effort, labor, equality, the overcome, together we get the idea of laboring not only for oneself, but for the larger community. Um, the not I, which is of course a key theme in Marxism. So from this perspective, sharing and communal living are inextricably linked to, to production. However, if, we, if all we had were such texts, we would be reinscribing the difference between knowledge and practice. Moreover, the ideas expressed would be merely utopian ideals. So the, the question that really emerges for these uh, Marxists is, where do we get? How do we get from here to there? The, 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 the question that the new Marxist reading has an answer to, because they have a, a logic of capital connected to technology that does point, right? So the crucial step in making the romantic anti-capitalist argument concerns a theory of history in which past ideals and practice, practices do not just pass, but re come back into the present. So here I'm going to, so, so, so this is the work um, of another Marx, Tamil Marxist named N. Mutumogan and his reading of the Asiatic mode of production. So without going into details, this contemporary Marxist um, contends that, and here I'm quoting, in the colonial capitalist Indian society, it is a fact that inherited foundations have changed. However, the Asiatic mode of production has survived for a long time, and it reveals itself by inf influencing identity politics. So here, what's very interesting is that the Asiatic mode of production, which Marx saw as where, you know, you didn't, it was, it was in some sense 
a pre-capitalist society that, that represents kind of stagnation, did not really have all this uh, potential or, or anything like that. It was oppressive and so on. But here he sees this as the potential for a new form of community, right? So um, it's not just a mode of the past, but it's something that also changes identity politics. So a, lot of, a large part of this book um, called uh, Tamil Identity, the dialectics of Tamil, Tamil identity politics, um, is, is really all about saying, well, how is Tamil identity politics different from what we call identity politics in, in other contexts, right? And he wants to say there's a different colonial context that, 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 that is at work here. Um, okay, so, but then where do we look for such, co uh, for, for such incompletely subsumed spaces, times, and practices? Clearly, one of the places we could look at is existing labor practices around the world and in India in particular. Perhaps places where the handicrafts have not given way to mechanization and communal ideals um, where such different forms of labor su survive. So now, coming to the final part um, of the talk. So, a little technology flying over here. Um, so, now you'd have... Now, the final part here is handloom weaving, right, with a question mark. Is it, is it something uh, that could be similar to this? Now, um, here I have another slide, uh, which is Uzrama and Malka's Back to the Future narrative. So, and here I have a quote. Uh, from Uzrama, um, which says, we want to establish the kind of production relations, and she's, this is all talking about handloom weaving, um, which in pre-colonial times were shared by a large group of people that made ordinary cloth for ordinary customers and sold them through local markets. No intermediaries, no expensive materials. Now what's very interesting here is, for me, is this idea that we want to go back, but really she's going back to the future. Right, I'm going to say, right, that it's not actually going back, but it's actually saying, looking at this, I want to go somewhere else. I want, that's, now, the problem is again going to be how we get there. So, so Uzrama and others have pointed out that contrary to those who speak about the triumph of technology, handloom weaving has continued to survive. So what do we make of this survival, right, is the question. The survi this survival provides support for the argument of formal subsumption that I mentioned, Tomba and others, right? So that capitalism is not completely subsuming things. It also provides a potential argument for what we call now another f school of Marxism called degrowth Marxism that's come in, right? So instead of technological, there's degrowth Marxism. That the answer is not more growth, but we have to degrowth, right? Now, the way out of capitalism is not including, increasing technological production, but to scale back and seek sustainable production. So the question then will be how one moves from a specific sustainable practice, which would be handloom weaving, to something, a vision that can be viable for a world or for a, even a nation. Okay, and that's going to be my last actual point. So now summary of section four. So, what we've done in section four. We saw that Marxists have a critique of romantic anti-capitalism, um, that, uh, namely that it could lead to fascism uh, at best, at worst, at, so at worst, and at best it's useless, right? However, we've seen Marxists on the periphery uh, of, capital, of the capitalist world system, such as Tamil Marxists, attempt to argue against this position. I argue that this overlaps with the current trend towards formal subsumption. I ended by posing the problem of finding actual remnants of practices in our contemporary moment, the back to the future narrative of handloom weaving, right? Okay, now the conclusion. So if we can establish that there are certain remnants of earlier practices, what some might call resilient forms of pre-modern labor, the next question is what is to be done? We've even seen, we've seen throughout the 20th and 21st centuries various forms of resistance from communities in the margins. And that's one of the things we have to do, is look for those. Perhaps the most famous of such movements are movements in Latin America, such as the Zapatistas, Chiapas, including numerous movements from indigenous people. And so one of the things we would have to do is connect these various forms of resistance. I hope that, I, the hope for romantic anti-capitalism would be that broader connections between various movements around the world are formed. 
these would then have to connect with other movements against, uh, against capitalism, right? Including, and especially perhaps, movements based on class. I don't think we can forget that, right? Okay, and so with that, I'm going to end. Uh, thank you all for your patience and time, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Capitalism, and I've learned a lot from that. And of course, I'm sure some of us have a few questions. Uh, then is your summary mean in that the, the progress of tech essentially anti-Marxist, that equality is not achieved if technology progresses the way it progresses now? Is, is that the sense I get from what you said? I think that's very correct. Technology is definitely not the solution. But the question really is how much is it not the solution, right? That is the difference between the two Marxists, right? Because even the, the new Marx reading, Postone, none of them, they're not going to say technology is the solution. But they are going to say the contradictions that emerge through technology provide the opening for um, a different society. Now, this is very important for people in the third world. Because according to the new Marx reading, the third world is not that important for Marxism. As because it doesn't have the same amount of technological development. And if it does, it's going to be an environmental disaster, right? So, so the problem, the, for them, the real, what, where Marxism might really be happening is actually in the, in, the, in the capitalist centers, right? Because that's where you're beginning to see, you know, labor being more and more obsolete. And, and this is the big debate amongst Marxists, because they say, well, yeah, but no, but the proletariat maybe in some places is increasing and so on, right? And, and, so, and so they're saying, no, no, but the real movement is really happening in the, in the, in, in the center. And the, and the movement against that, once you start saying, no, 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 there could be things in the non-capitalist past that, that are meaningful, for a future. Well, then all of a sudden, the periphery starts looking much more interesting. So, so that, I think, are the stakes here, that none of the positions are saying, no, technology alone is the answer. But one side is saying, technology at least is part of the, the answer. And so let me give you another example, and, and, that would, and this would relate to China. Because we all know China had a revolution, right? 1949, there's a revolution. Now the question is, how do we understand that revolution if, if we're interested in the Marxist project? It was a Marxist revolution. Now, according to Postone especially, but some of the other people in the, in, the, in the new Marx reading as well, that revolution cannot be called a socialist revolution. Why? Because they didn't have the right, they didn't have, they weren't producing technology at the same, at, at, in 49, China was not adequately capitalist. So then what happened after the revolution, according to them? You get the revolution, you take state power, and then what do you do? You create capitalism, right? You end up having to use the state to do what the capitalists did in the West, right? That is their argument. Now, the other side is saying, no, 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 there was a potential. There was all this stuff happening in the countryside. All of that could be used. So you get two different readings of Mao, of, of Mao on this, right? One is Mao, they both sort of like Mao, right? One is Mao's really great because he created capitalism, right? Um, the other is, no, 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 Mao was actually a, a socialist having some kind of potentially, potential resistance that may have then gone in, in another direction. I, I saw a large number of, hundreds of families of weavers during my childhood in 60s and 70s. Today in the same places like Narsapuram, Pulet Kuru, in East and West Godavari districts, the families dwindled. Hmm. This weaver's model, Mm -hmm. Might have worked in China because I know anything about China. Yeah. But the weaver's model is failing in India. The Marxian theory of surplus labor has come into being. I don't know about uh, uh, you told about Tirukkural. Even Kanchipuram, I had been to Kanchipuram. This Marxist model is taking over. This surplus labor theory is coming into being. So I doubt very much. Whether this weaver's, weaver's model is good, I agree with you. The foundational weaver's model, which I saw in 1960s and 70s, is, it was really good. But whether it can be reinvented with the technology is of doubtful nature. So what is your response to this observation? Uh, but I think um, 
the, the, the real issue here uh, is where, where do we want it to go, right? So if you agree that, the, that, you, that there is something to be salvaged from this Weaver's model, yes, right? right. So then I think your question is really how do we go about it, right? And that's the final question that I was asking, right? How do we then, it can't, it can't be something that um, just remains on its own, right? And we just go to it as a ready-made, right? I think the question that you're suggesting is saying there is something there, but how do we then connect it to these other things, right? How do we then make it such that it's transforming, right? I mean, I had a picture. Um, Exactly, exactly. So how do, and we have to realize what you're saying, I, what I hear you saying is, no, we can't go back to the past. We can't take that as a, as a ready-made. We have to sort of, in some sense, transform the model as it dialectically react, interacts with these other things and transform these other things, right? So technology can't be the same either afterwards, right? And I think that, I think, is, is, is the direction in which I would go to, to try to begin um, answering your question. Because I think one of the things, um, one of the slides I had was, okay, um, you have handloom weaving, you've got the finished, finished product, and then you've got a price tag on it, right? That's, that's the three things you see here. Now, what that shows is really the way in which, okay, it, it, it's continuing, it's surviving. But is it survival, right? what is it doing in terms of the existing system? It's in some sense, if it stays as it is now, it may not be that interesting for me, for us, right? I mean, it has to, it has to do something more. Because if it's just a remnant, the existing system can say, sure, let's have a remnant there, right? Uh, and, you know, there, there's going to be a competition. But, you know, it could, what, what I think is not happening it, completely is that technology is completely taking over. And we see these, we still see these pockets. But I think what you're saying is, well, how do we then move those pockets? How do we make it such that it does provide a, yeah, it does provide a, 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 a vision to resist what you're saying is, you know, that it's all becoming surplus labor. Because surplus labor, to me, sounds again like technological mediation, right? I mean, that where all of a sudden the labor's capital is not able to absorb the labor, right? And some moments in France, if I, if, then I could also correct my views the 99%. Um, and, and I think the problem there was it was, so, it was so disorganized in some sense. There were so many different people in that movement that what you had was a critique of inequality, but I don't think there was a larger social program um, um, that was somehow united as to what to do about it, right? And I think that's what, that's, that's when we really get um, a certain problem that, you know, people are seeing that there's something wrong. You know, people all over the world, whether, whether it's in France, the United States, here, um, various parts, there's something wrong. There's, there's, life is sort of out of balance, right? And then the question then becomes, what's the solution? And I think that's where we're weakest. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, and this is why, you know, the critique of anti, uh, romantic anti-capitalism is becoming so so important uh, because because in some sense what these Marxists see is that you're going to have more and more romantic anti-capitalism coming up, right? That's going to be the big, and that's where someone some of them see Trump, for example, as a romantic anti-capitalist in some way. Well, even though he's not anti-capitalist at all, but what there is is the critique of neoliberalism in some to some extent, and a lot of the working class sees him as a resistance to the system. Right? And I think that's, that, I think, is sort of one of, the, one of the problems is when you don't, when the left doesn't have a very clear perception of where it's going, you can often have the right coming in, which has, in some sense, a more workable strategy, even though it's not going where, where the left wants to go. Right? Um, and, and this is one of the reasons, because one of the, the things I, I work on is, you know, in the 1930s and 40s, you have a lot of Japanese intellectuals who switched from left to right. And one of the reasons was the left was all talking about, okay, we're going to do this working class movement and so on. And, the, and, and everyone's seeing that's not going to happen. And the right has a ready-made thing. It has the state. It has the emperor. And he says, we're going to attack capitalism with the emperor system. 
And then all of these people said, okay, we're going to do that. We're going we're to follow that, right? And I think that's the danger that we're in now. I think that, that uh, we need to have more and more kind of programs of, of where we're going with this, right? And I think that's what you're... And that, I think, the, the anti-99% in some sense is, of course, connected to this. But it didn't have, I think, a, a, a larger project, and it didn't, it, that's why it didn't last as long. Yeah, I'm Dinesh, and uh, Marxism, why there's no freedom of expression? Like, so let's say if Jack Ma spoke against uh, China, uh, after he was spoken, he was not there in the, to be seen for a couple of months, and his company has come down, Alibaba. In Marxism, is there a deficiency in freedom of expression? Like Actually existing socialisms. Uh, from Marx himself. So, they're, they're, so I think that's the first thing. That I think in Marx's writings himself, I don't find that much that says, you know, we should be controlling um, freedom of, of, of expression. Um, so, but, but I think the other question you're asking is really a, one specific to China, right? Uh, and contemporary China. So I think a couple of questions we would have to a a ask there first is do you see contemporary China as a particularly Marxist state, right? I think that's, there I don't, there, I'm not, I don't know if I would, I would follow that, right? So I don't think we can take contemporary China or what Xi Jinping does as an example of, of Marxism or romantic anti-capitalism. Anti um, but there is another question that is important here and is that how much can the state control capitalists, right? And, and here, there's a question of what is freedom, right? What is freedom? And um, freedom, I think, on the Marxist view, um, does not, is, is at, the, at, at once individual and communal. So that if there is an idea that someone is going against the communal interests, by, in some sense, f curtailing some of his actions, you are actually promoting freedom. So this is, this is a line of thought that goes all the way back to Rousseau, right? The, the very famous line he has, like, force d'être libre, forced to be free, right? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a line that I really like, but it causes uh, liberals a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems, right? Because how can you be forced to be free? And here, the idea here is that if freedom is at once individual and communal, if you are going against the community in some certain, certain way, you can be forced to be free, right? So that, that, that becomes the, to a, to a certain extent, of course, and this is where their judgment is topic of not. Many people are referring about e equality and working class and non-working class. Satya Nadella gets 458 crores per year. Another IT man gets 15,000 rupees per, per month. Can we call it as a working class? Both of them are working class. And one more thing, sir. Do you think that communism or Marxism is there in the, in the world? When China, Chinese man has declared himself as the permanent, permanent secretary of the Communist Party of China, and when Putin is the largest, uh, richest man in the world, how can we describe the communism? Because uh, what, uh, it should help majority of the people. Communism should help majority of the people. They may be working class or cap capitalistic. They have to go help majority of the people for which government will get the taxes and all. Actually has to do with the very definition of the working class. And I think it's a, it's a serious question in, in Marxism and not, not one that, that I would claim is easy, easily answered. Because the question really has to do with, well, who is the working class? Right? Who is the working class? And we have to realize that the term working class does not just mean poor people, right? But under Marx, there's a very specific definition, and that has to do with the producer of value, the producer of surplus value, actually. So who are those? And I've, I've had problems with this itself. I mean, because, it, because, okay, so what it means, what does it mean to be a producer of surplus value? Now, what it, this is connected to a distinction that he makes between productive and unproductive labor, right? So productive labor is that which produces value for a capitalist. So if you are working for a capitalist, then you are producing value. Now this immediately brings up the questions that, that you're posing, right? Because there are those who are 
working for the capitalist but making very little, but those closer to the administrative, right? And here we have the problem of mental and manual labor. Usually those doing much more mental labor are going to be higher. Now what that means, so now moving away from just that definition, strategically, who are we going to really sort of rely on for a movement? It's going to be those at the, at the lower level, right? It's going to be harder to go to, you know, take, you know, this, this is something that my students often, you know, tell, ask me, because they say, well, hey, if you want to say those who are producing value, well, if Brad Pitt is working for MGM, is he, is he a proletariat? And, and, and you could say from the strict Marxist definition, if MGM is making a profit from, from him, and he doesn't own part of it, right? That's the problem with, he might, if he owns, then he's, not, but if he doesn't own part of it, then you're right, he's being exploited, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we take the person earning 15,000 rupees and, and then say, okay, well, Brad Pitt, let you guys unite. I mean, that can't, that can't be the, that can't be the strategy. So that, I think the first question is strategic. So we don't, we, we want to, theoretically, we want to say, we're going to change the system so that neither of them are going to be exploited. Because the, the point is Brad Pitt, according to this, this, is being exploited, except that as he's being exploited, he's having a great time, right? Um, and and that, is, that, is, that is the thing, right? So, so which, and because of that, he's not going to uh, be that interested in joining the, uh, this, this, this other person, right? So then the problem of whether communist, communism exists today. No, I don't think so. I don't think it exists now. I think we basically have a, a global capitalist world in which there are, you know, what I would call Russia and China, especially China, some, some kind of hybrid regime. Um, so that where, where you have a lot of capitalist domination, but you also have uh, quite a bit of state control, and that works for better and for worse, right? There's some things that it can do better, there's some things that, 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 that cause it problems, right? And so then, so then you get the question of how do you do an analysis of the rise of such people? How do you do an analysis of, 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 of Putin and so on? And I think what, what really emerges, I mean, to think about the emergence of someone like Putin, you really have to think about, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, what, you know, how the, the U.S. then tried to bring in people like Yeltsin and so on, that didn't work. Um, and, and there was an attempt to sort of almost do a kind of shock therapy to, to, to get capitalism. But you don't get capitalism like that. Uh, and you end up getting something else, you know, something like, you know, crony capitalism. There are different terms that you can use to talk about that. Now, China took another path, right? China did not take the, the shock therapy model. Right? In fact, that was the big thing. In the beginning, people were saying, oh, that's going to be China's future. But China instead decided, no, we're going to, we're going to actually keep the Communist Party and then have the reforms under that, that party. Now, you know, people have always been saying it's in crisis because now you get more and more um, capitalist um, kinds of production with a, with a Communist Party that still is supposed to be socialist, right? And, and that's, that's going to be a tension. Um, so, so that I think that, you know, each of these cases would have to be studied independently. I can't resist this. There is a lot of difference, fundamental difference between communism and capitalism. Communism, man exploits man. In capitalism, it is the other way around. You had not mentioned Gandhi in the entire framework that you had built because uh, I thought it was so relevant and he had very specific ideas on anti-capitalism, industrialism, industrial revolution, on environment, on village economy, and on weavers as well. So I was just wondering why Gandhi didn't occur in your, uh, in your discourse. Yeah, thank you very much. No, that's a good point. I think, I think Gandhi could have very much uh, been part of it. I just felt there's a lot that's been written on Gandhi, and, and in, although maybe not as a romantic anti-capitalist. So, so it is something that one could develop. I think he definitely fits um, the, the romantic anti-capitalist uh, vision. And, and also, uh, I think he's relevant for being able to articulate it at a national level, right? Because he was able to say, okay, we're going to go from this romantic anti-capitalist uh, vision that might be very much inspired by localities and then connect it to a larger global anti-imperialist uh, anti-imperialist vision. Yeah, right. So I would I would say, yeah. 
you have taken and connected the two subjects very well done, I must say. But there's something that you have to take into account when you're applying it to a country or to a state. You've not taken into account diversity. You see, the, the, the problem that comes up in a country like India is this, it's not homogeneous. And therefore, there's never been a control by one center. There's always been diversity. There have been smaller controlled centers. And within them, they might work out the relationship, which be, it could be a village level. See, therefore, it, you, you know, when you talk in terms of happiness and you want to uh, relate it to your concept of capitalism, the, the, it is possible at a very micro level. When you want to apply to a larger level, you're getting too vast and losing the focus. Great. Okay, thanks. I think that's a good point. And I think that's, that's been the, uh, the dilemma for Marxism as well. I mean, I, all, all the time. That it, because there's no getting away from it. I mean, Marxism is a global vision. It is not, it's not just a local vision, even though it starts at the local vision. And, and, but, but I think, to be fair, the point is that you're not actually even going to be able to solve the local problem without getting at the, at the larger global issue, right? So to put it more concretely, there's going to be the idea that around the world, even though there are enormous differences, these differences and these different communities are going to face similar problems, right? The problems of capitalism are going to be there for, for a lot of people. The problem of production. Um, and this we see, you know, whether you're dealing with local, local communities that, that uh, produce different things or so on, you're going to have enormous diversity. But are we going to say that their problems are completely different? I think that is what the Marxist uh, analysis wants to say. That may have been true previously. But to the extent that capitalism becomes global, it starts transforming agriculture, it starts transforming all kinds of things, and at least it has that potential. It's, even if it doesn't transform you at, at this point, it's knocking at the door, right? It's, it's trying to, is, is that getting at, at, the, at, the, um, at, at your question? No. Um, express a model and want your opinion on this. You gave an analogy of how a robo sits on a man and a man sits on a robo. Uh, now, what if this analogy could be uh, taken this way, like a man teaches the robo his ways of work and makes it work uh, the way he wants, while he gets uh, free time in the meanwhile to concentrate and venture into other things. Like uh, motivation for asking this question is since ancient times we have been living like uh, we concentrate on agriculture first, then uh, with um, development of tools we got free time to get into construction, pottery, uh, other ventures. Like that we have progressed a long way and then we got automated machines, now we are venturing into the era of AI. So we can teach those things how a man thinks, works and make them do their, uh, their work as a man wants. And man can venture into other things like which are not yet concentrated on completely, like the uh, pollution in the ocean, uh, let it be pollution in the ocean. The, I'm just giving a reference that uh, there are many things man hasn't ventured into to make this society a better place to live. Like uh, um, we are building urbanization uh, while not concentrating on greenery in the urbanization. Like I'm just quoting from environment. There are many other um, areas like even in politics. Uh, there are many things to concentrate on. Uh, so uh, does this, uh, so this actually doesn't even reduce the labor also. Like we give machines a chance, then labor gets involved in some other things. Uh, so what could be a problem with this kind of model? Okay, um, so you brought a number of interesting points here. Um, and I think, the, but the fundamental point really has to do with something like technology, labor, and AI, I think is, is what well, I could put it in, in those, those three. And I think in um, fundamentally the idea that, okay, technology perhaps doesn't always replace labor, right? In the sense that once the technology comes, you might have new jobs, right? You might have people, you know, for example, if, if anything to, you know, service the machines or, or things like that. There are all these jobs that, that kind of uh, open up once you have um, uh, technology. But I think the fundamental, your fundamental point, um, I don't think I disagree with in the sense that 
I think it is in some sense some version of the idea of the man controlling the machine, right? Because you're saying you tell the machine what to do and then we have time for other things, right? So to that extent, it's very much in line with the new reading of Marx, right? The, Marx, the reading of Marx that focuses on the, on the Grundrisse. Now the problem here is what is technology being used for, right? That's really the question. Right, and what is, why, do, why is technology coming into the story in the first place? It is not primarily to help us deal with our problem, but rather it is in order to increase profit or surplus value, right? So un until we break that system, your ideal um, on this, arg on this reading will not be able to be reali realized, right? So we can think it, yeah, wouldn't it be nice, right, for us to be able to use machines that way? But the point is that we are in a system now where, um, and here again, despite the various diversity, that's not where, that's not how technology is being used, right? So the point here is, the point on this reading would be to change the system such that that is how technology is being used, right? So that is how I, I, AI is being used, right? That would be the, that would be the, that, I think that would be the way in which I would begin to answer.